When did the Napoleonic Wars begin and end? The Napoleonic Wars began shortly after Napoleon Bonaparte, 1769 to 1821, took power and lasted until 1815. When he was finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. Ever the general, Napoleon used his power to keep France at war throughout his reign. After the coup d'état of 18th Brumaire, November 1799, which had put Napoleon in power. At first he effected peace, in May 1800 he marched across the Alps to defeat the Austrians. Ending the war with them that had begun eight years earlier. Britain, fearing a growing European power on the continent, had declared war on France in 1793, by 1802, having grown tired of battle. The country agreed to peace with Napoleon in the Treaty of Amiens. But the calm in Europe was not to last. By 1803 the diminutive but power-hungry Napoleon, nicknamed the Little Corporal, had begun to plot an invasion of Britain. Declaring himself emperor in 1804, he initiated a series of campaigns across Europe. And by 1806 most of the continent was under his control. He remained, of course, unable to beat the British, whose superior navy gave them supremacy at sea. But the various alliances, called coalitions, formed by European countries against Napoleon eventually broke him. After he had been defeated in Russia in 1812, the European powers that had long been held in submission by Napoleon formed a sixth and final coalition against him, Great Britain, Russia, Sweden, Prussia. And Austria met Napoleon's army at the momentous Battle of the Nations at Leipzig, Poland. From October 16 to 19, 1813, Napoleon was defeated there in what is sometimes called the War of Liberation, and he retreated to France. The following March, the Allies making up the Sixth Coalition took Paris. Napoleon's generals were defeated. He abdicated the throne on April 6. However, that was not the end of the Napoleonic era. Exiled to the Mediterranean island of Elba, Napoleon returned to Paris on March 20, 1815. Believing he could recover power in the unstable atmosphere that followed his abdication. Three months later he was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. On June 18. It was the last battle of the Napoleonic Wars. He was exiled to St. Helena Island, where he died in 1821. Who was Tamerlane? Tamerlane, 1336-1405, was a Central Asian conqueror who gained power in the late 1300s. His Islamic name was Timur, Tamerlane is the English version. He was a barbaric warrior and a brilliant military leader whose fearsome tactics earned him the name Tamerlane the Terrible. By 1370 he was a powerful warlord whose government was centered in the province of Samarkand. In present-day Uzbekistan. 
In 1383 he launched a series of conquests that lasted more than 20 years and gained him control of a vast region including Iraq. Armenia, Mesopotamia, Georgia, Russia, and parts of India. He died in 1405, on an expedition to conquer China. His body was entombed in an elaborate mausoleum, which is considered a treasure of Islamic art. After his death, his sons and grandsons fought for control of his dynasty which remained intact for another hundred years. Tamerlane and his heirs built Samarkand into a great city. In its day it was a center for culture and scholarship in Central Asia. What was the oath of the tennis court? It was the oath taken in June 1789 by a group of representatives of France's Third Estate who, having been rejected by King Louis XVI, 1754-1793, and the First and the Second Estates, vowed to form a French National Assembly and write their own constitution. The pledge set off a string of events that began the French Revolution, 1789-99. French society had long been divided into three classes, called estates. Members of the clergy were the first estate, nobles comprised the second, and everyone else made up the third. When philosophers such as Jean Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, came along and challenged the king's supreme authority by promoting the idea that the right to rule came not from God but from the people. It fueled the discontent felt by the long-suffering peasants and the prosperous middle class who paid most of the taxes to run the government but who had no voice in it. In short these people were the disenfranchised third estate. A government financial crisis brought on by the expense of war forced King Louis XVI to reluctantly call a meeting of the representatives of all three estates, called the Estates General, which had last convened in 1614. During the May 5, 1789, meeting at Versailles. The Third Estate attempted to seize power from the nobility, the clergy, and the king by insisting that the three estates be combined to form a national assembly in which each member had one vote. Since the Third Estate had as many representatives as the other two combined, the people would at last have a voice. When the attempt failed, the representatives of the Third Estate gathered on a Versailles tennis court, where they vowed to change the government. Louis XVI began assembling troops to break up the meeting. Meantime, an armed resistance movement had begun to organize. The situation came to a head on July 14, 1789, with the storming of the Bastille in Paris. Who was the first to go around the world? Why see? The first to circumnavigate the globe was the Basque navigator Juan Sebastián de Elcano, c. 1476 to 1526, though 18 sailors who made the trip with him also claim the distinction. The trip was completed in 1522 and had taken nearly three years. 
In 1519, Elcano had set out with Ferdinand Magellan, c. 1480-1521, on a Spanish-sponsored expedition that became the first one successful in finding a western route to the east. Having rounded the southernmost point of mainland South America. In 1520, and entering into the South Pacific, the expedition reached the Philippines in 1521. When Magellan was killed there, it was Elcano who took leadership of the crew and guided the expedition westward. Returning to Spain as the first sea captain to go around the world. What was Thomas Cavendish's claim to fame? English navigator Thomas Cavendish, c. 1560-1592, followed in Sir Francis Drake's, 1540 or 1543-1596, footsteps. Seeing Drake return from his exploits at sea and against the Spanish, Cavendish was inspired. And it was for good reason, Drake had earned himself fame, wealth, and the honor of being knighted. So in 1586 Cavendish set out with three ships for Brazil, made it through the Strait of Magellan. And then proceeded to capture Spanish treasure including their prized ship, the Santa Ana. The kings of Spain later mourned the loss and the fact that the ship had been taken by an English youth, with 40 or 50 companions. Cavendish, now in the Pacific, continued his voyage, which took him to the Philippines. Moluccas, and Java before he rounded the Cape of Good Hope, Africa, and returned home. The journey had taken two years and fifty days, cost him two of his own ships, and made him the third person to circumnavigate the globe. But his welcome in England was not what he expected. Cavendish was received with acclaim, but was not knighted by the Queen. The fame and fortune that had come his way quickly vanished. He spent most of his new money, and his renown soon faded. By 1590 Cavendish thought he would try the journey again. Setting sail with five ships in August 1591, the fleet was headed for trouble. Having made it to South America. Heavy storms separated the ships as they attempted to make their way through the Strait of Magellan. The ship Cavendish captain turned back toward Brazil, attempting to make landfall. But Cavendish himself never made it. He died en route, believing he had been deserted by his mates. How was Rome sacked? After the split of the Roman Empire in 395, the West Roman Empire continued to weaken and Rome became subject to a series of brutal attacks by Germanic tribes. In 410 the Visigoths moved into Italy and looted Rome, in 455 the Vandals thoroughly ravaged the city. Finally, in 476 the city fell when the Germanic chieftain Odoacer 433 to 493 forced Romulus Augustulus, c. 450, the last ruler of the empire, 
from the throne. By this time, however, Germanic chiefs had already begun claiming Roman lands and dividing them into several smaller kingdoms. The year 476 marks the official collapse of the West Roman Empire. Who was Hawaii LOA? He was a Polynesian chief who sailed some 2,400 miles of open water from the Marquesas Islands near Tahiti, to discover the Hawaiian Islands in the A. D. 400s. The islands were first discovered by Europeans in 1778 when British navigator Captain James Cook 1728 to 1779 landed on the island of Kauai and named the islands after John Montague, c. 1718 to 1792, who was the 4th Earl of Sandwich and 1st Lord of the Admiralty. Captain Cook died there at the hand of the natives in a skirmish over a stolen boat. What were Captain Cook's discoveries? British navigator Captain James Cook, 1728-1779, was one of the world's greatest explorers. Commanding three voyages to the Pacific Ocean and sailing around the world twice. From 1768 to 1771, aboard the ship Endeavour, Cook conducted an expedition to the South Pacific, where he landed in Tahiti, and made the first European discovery of the coasts of New Zealand, Australia, and New Guinea, which he also charted. In 1772 Cook set out to find the great southern continent that was believed to exist. He spent three years on this voyage, which edged along the ice fields of Antarctica. On his last voyage, which he undertook in 1776 on a mission to find a passage around North America from the Pacific, Cook charted the Pacific coast of North America as far north as the Bering Strait. He met his death in 1778 on the Hawaiian Islands. Cook's voyages led to the establishment of Pacific Ocean colonies by several European nations. What was the London Protocol? The 1830 decree recognized an independent Greek nation. After the eight-year Greek War for Independence, 1821-29, the London Protocol officially ended Ottoman Turk rule of Greece, which had begun almost 400 years earlier. In 1453 the Ottoman Turks conquered Constantinople, present-day Istanbul, Turkey, and they soon moved westward to bring the Greek peninsula under their control as well. By 1456 most of Greece had been absorbed into the Ottoman Empire. Hundreds of years later, in 1770, the Greeks tried to overthrow the Turks and were aided in. This effort by Russian Tsar Nikatharine the Great, 1729-1796. Whose aim it was to replace Muslim rule with Orthodox Christian rule throughout the Near East. But the effort was unsuccessful. 
and it was 50 years before the Greeks would rise again to assert their independence. On March 25, 1821, the Greeks, led by the Archbishop of Patras, proclaimed a war of independence against the Turks. Soon, Egypt had thrown its military support behind the Turks. But even the combined force could neither defeat the Greeks nor squelch the revolution. In 1827 Britain, France and Russia, all sympathetic to the Greek cause, came to their aid. In October of that year a combined fleet of the three European powers defeated the Turk and Egyptian fleet in the Battle of Navarino, off the Peloponnese Peninsula. But the deciding moment came when Russia declared war on the Ottoman Empire in 1828. And the Ottoman Turks turned their attention to fighting the Russians. The following year, the Egyptians withdrew from Greece. In March 1830 the London Protocol was signed by Britain. France, and Russia, recognizing an independent Greece. Weary from the fighting, the Ottoman Turks accepted the terms of the proclamation later that year. What was the London Protocol? The 1830 decree recognized an independent Greek nation. After the eight-year Greek War for Independence, 1821-29. The London Protocol officially ended Ottoman Turk rule of Greece, which had begun almost 400 years earlier. In 1453 the Ottoman Turks conquered Constantinople, present-day Istanbul, Turkey, and they soon moved westward to bring the Greek peninsula under their control as well. By 1456 most of Greece had been absorbed into the Ottoman Empire. Hundreds of years later, in 1770, the Greeks tried to overthrow the Turks and were aided in. This effort by Russian Tsar Nikatharin the Great, 1729-1796, whose aim it was to replace Muslim rule with Orthodox Christian rule throughout the Near East. But the effort was unsuccessful. And it was 50 years before the Greeks would rise again to assert their independence. On March 25, 1821, the Greeks, led by the Archbishop of Patras, proclaimed a war of independence against the Turks. Soon, Egypt had thrown its military support behind the Turks. But even the combined force could neither defeat the Greeks nor squelch the revolution. In 1827 Britain, France and Russia, all sympathetic to the Greek cause, came to their aid. In October of that year a combined fleet of the three European powers defeated the Turk and Egyptian fleet in the Battle of Navarino, off the Peloponnese Peninsula. But the deciding moment came when Russia declared war on the Ottoman Empire in 1828 and the Ottoman Turks turned their attention to fighting the Russians. The following year, the Egyptians withdrew from Greece. In March 1830 the London Protocol was signed by Britain, France, and Russia, recognizing an independent Greece. Weary from the fighting, the Ottoman Turks accepted the terms of the proclamation later that year.
What does remember the Alamo mean? The saying was a rallying cry for Texans in their war for independence from Mexico. The movement for independence had begun in the winter of 1835-36 when the people of Texas decided to cut off relations with Mexico. And soon turned into a war when the Mexican government sent a force of some 4,000 troops. Under the command of General Antonio López de Santa Ana, 1794-1876, to squelch the rebellion. As the Mexican army approached, the force of about 150 men who were determined to defend the city of San Antonio retreated to the Alamo, a Spanish mission built in the previous century. There they were joined by another 50 men but were still no match for the Mexicans. Who kept the Alamo under siege for 13 days from February 23 to March 6, 1836. The Texans, low on ammunition, ceased to return fire. On the morning of March 6, Santa Ana's troops seized the Alamo. The fierce frontiersmen, Davy Crockett, 1786-1836, among them, are believed to have fought using the butts of their rifles. All the Texans who fought that day at the Alamo died. Meantime, General Sam Houston, 1793-1863, had assembled his forces. And with the rallying cry remember the Alamo, and their fellow Texans who had bravely fought and died there. He set out to face the Mexican army and secure independence. This he did, at San Jacinto, Texas, on April 21, 1836. In a quick and decisive battle that had caught Santa Ana's troops by surprise. The following day the Mexican general was captured and made to sign a treaty giving Texas independence. What does remember the Alamo mean? The saying was a rallying cry for Texans in their war for independence from Mexico. The movement for independence had begun in the winter of 1835-36 when the people of Texas decided to cut off relations with Mexico. And soon turned into a war when the Mexican government sent a force of some 4,000 troops. Under the command of General Antonio López de Santa Ana, 1794-1876, to squelch the rebellion. As the Mexican army approached, the force of about 150 men who were determined to defend the city of San Antonio retreated to the Alamo, a Spanish mission built in the previous century. There they were joined by another 50 men but were still no match for the Mexicans. Who kept the Alamo under siege for 13 days from February 23 to March 6, 1836. The Texans, low on ammunition, ceased to return fire. On the morning of March 6, Santa Ana's troops seized the Alamo. The fierce frontiersmen, Davy Crockett, 1786-1836, among them, are believed to have fought using the butts of their rifles. All the Texans who fought that day at the Alamo died. Meantime, General Sam Houston, 1793-1863, had assembled his forces. 
and with the rallying cry remember the Alamo, and their fellow Texans who had bravely fought and died there. He set out to face the Mexican army and secure independence. This he did, at San Jacinto, Texas, on April 21, 1836. In a quick and decisive battle that had caught Santa Ana's troops by surprise. The following day the Mexican general was captured and made to sign a treaty giving Texas independence. What caused the Mexican War? The Two-Year War, 1846-48, was fought over the United States' annexation of Texas. The events that led up to the conflict began in 1837 when President Andrew Jackson 1767-1845, recognized Texas as independent, this was just after Texas had won its war with Mexico. Republic of Texas President Sam Houston, 1793-1863, felt that protection against a Mexican invasion may be necessary, so he eyed annexation to the United States. In the meantime, Mexican President Antonio López de Santa Ana, 1794-1876, warned that such an action on the part of the United States would be equivalent to a declaration of war against the Mexican Republic. In June 1844 the U.S. Senate rejected a proposed annexation treaty. But later that year Democratic Party nominee James K. Polk, 1795-1849, an ardent expansionist, was elected president. Because the annexation of Texas had figured prominently in his campaign platform, outgoing President John Tyler, 1790-1862, viewed Polk's victory as a public mandate for annexation. And he recommended that Congress pass a joint resolution to invite Texas into the Union. Congress did so in February, and President Tyler signed the resolution on March 1, 1845. Three days before leaving office. Mexico responded by breaking off diplomatic relations with the United States. A border dispute made the situation increasingly tenuous, Texas claimed that its southern border was the Rio Grande River. While Mexico insisted it was the Nueces River, situated farther north. In June President Polk ordered Brigadier General Zachary Taylor, 1784-1850, to move his forces into the disputed area. In November the U.S. government received word that Mexico was prepared to talk. Polk dispatched Congressman John Slidell, 1793 to 1871, to Mexico to discuss three other outstanding issues. The purchase of California, for $25 million, the purchase of New Mexico, for $5 million, and the payment of damages to American nationals for losses incurred in Mexican revolutions. This last point was critical to the negotiations. As Polk was prepared to have the United States assume payment of damages to its own citizens in exchange for Mexico's recognition of the Rio Grande as the southern border of Texas. But upon arrival in Mexico City, Slidell was refused the meeting President Jose Joaquim Herrera. 
1792-1854, had bowed to pressure, opposing discussions with the United States. When Polk received news of the scuttled talks, he authorized General Taylor to advance through the disputed territory to the Rio Grande. Meanwhile, Mexico overthrew President Herrera. Putting into office the fervent nationalist General Mariano Paredes y Arrilaga, 1797-1849, who reaffirmed Mexico's claim to Texas and pledged to defend Mexican territory. While Polk worked through Slidell to get an audience with the Mexican government, the attempts failed. And on May 9 the cabinet met and approved the president's recommendation to ask Congress to declare war. The next day news arrived in Washington that on April 25 a sizable Mexican force had crossed the Rio Grande and surrounded a smaller American reconnaissance party. Eleven Americans were killed and the rest were wounded or captured. On May 11, Polk delivered a message to Congress, concluding, Mexico has shed American blood upon the American soil, war exists, by the act of Mexico herself. By the time the war was officially declared. On May 13, just more than one year after Polk had been sworn into office. General Taylor had already fought and won key battles against the Mexicans and had occupied the northern Mexico city of Matamoros. What caused the Mexican War? The Two-Year War, 1846-48, was fought over the United States' annexation of Texas. The events that led up to the conflict began in 1837 when President Andrew Jackson, 1767-1845, recognized Texas as independent, this was just after Texas had won its war with Mexico. Republic of Texas President Sam Houston, 1793-1863, felt that protection against a Mexican invasion may be necessary, so he eyed annexation to the United States. In the meantime, Mexican President Antonio López de Santa Anna, 1794-1876, warned that such an action on the part of the United States would be equivalent to a declaration of war against the Mexican Republic. In June 1844 the U.S. Senate rejected a proposed annexation treaty. But later that year Democratic Party nominee James K. Polk, 1795-1849, an ardent expansionist, was elected president. Because the annexation of Texas had figured prominently in his campaign platform, outgoing President John Tyler, 1790-1862, viewed Polk's victory as a public mandate for annexation. And he recommended that Congress pass a joint resolution to invite Texas into the Union. Congress did so in February, and President Tyler signed the resolution on March 1, 1845. Three days before leaving office, Mexico responded by breaking off diplomatic relations with the United States. A border dispute made the situation increasingly tenuous, Texas claimed that its southern border was the Rio Grande River. While Mexico insisted it was the Nueces River, situated farther north, 
In June President Polk ordered Brigadier General Zachary Taylor, 1784-1850, to move his forces into the disputed area. In November the U.S. government received word that Mexico was prepared to talk. Polk dispatched Congressman John Slidell, 1793 to 1871, to Mexico to discuss three other outstanding issues. The purchase of California, for $25 million, the purchase of New Mexico, for $5 million. And the payment of damages to American nationals for losses incurred in Mexican revolutions. This last point was critical to the negotiations. As Polk was prepared to have the United States assume payment of damages to its own citizens in exchange. For Mexico's recognition of the Rio Grande as the southern border of Texas. But upon arrival in Mexico City, Slidell was refused the meeting President José Joaquín Herrera. 1792-1854, had bowed to pressure, opposing discussions with the United States. When Polk received news of the scuttled talks, he authorized General Taylor to advance through the disputed territory to the Rio Grande. Meanwhile, Mexico overthrew President Herrera. Putting into office the fervent nationalist General Mariano Paredes y Arrilaga, 1797-1849, who reaffirmed Mexico's claim to Texas and pledged to defend Mexican territory. While Polk worked through Slidell to get an audience with the Mexican government, the attempts failed. And on May 9 the cabinet met and approved the president's recommendation to ask Congress to declare war. The next day news arrived in Washington that on April 25 a sizable Mexican force had crossed the Rio Grande and surrounded a smaller American reconnaissance party. Eleven Americans were killed and the rest were wounded or captured. On May 11th Polk delivered a message to Congress, concluding, Mexico has shed American blood upon the American soil, war exists, by the act of Mexico herself. By the time the war was officially declared. On May 13th, just more than one year after Polk had been sworn into office. General Taylor had already fought and won key battles against the Mexicans and had occupied the northern Mexico city of Matamoros. What did the United States gain from the Mexican War? The Mexican War, 1846-48, was officially ended when the U.S. Senate ratified the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on March 10, 1848. By the treaty, Mexico relinquished roughly half its territory New Mexico and California to the United States. Mexico also recognized the Rio Grande as its border with Texas. Mexico received payments in the millions from the United States, which also assumed the payment of claims of its citizens. Five years later under the terms of the Gadsden Purchase, the United States purchased a small portion of land from Mexico for another $10 million, which was widely regarded as further compensation for the land lost in the war. The territory the United States gained was in present-day Arizona and New Mexico, south of the Gila River.
What did the United States gain from the Mexican War? The Mexican War, 1846-48, was officially ended when the U.S. Senate ratified the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on March 10, 1848. By the treaty, Mexico relinquished roughly half its territory New Mexico and California to the United States. Mexico also recognized the Rio Grande as its border with Texas. Mexico received payments in the millions from the United States. Which also assumed the payment of claims of its citizens. Five years later under the terms of the Gadsden Purchase. The United States purchased a small portion of land from Mexico for another $10 million. Which was widely regarded as further compensation for the land lost in the war. The territory the United States gained was in present-day Arizona and New Mexico, south of the Gila River. What is privateering? Privateering is the hiring of privately owned ships and their crews to fight during battle. The practice, dating back to the 1400s, continued well into the 1800s. Eventually replaced by the development of strong navies. Privateers were, essentially, gunboats for hire. They played a crucial role in the American Revolutionary War, 1775-83, after the Second Continental. Congress authorized their use on March 18, 1776, enabling the colonists to capture about 600 British ships. The Americans would again employ privateers in the War of 1812, 1812-14. But during times of peace, some privateers turned to pirating, which at least in part prompted European nations to sign the Treaty of Paris of 1856, which ended the Crimean War, 1853-56, and outlawed privateering. Since the United States had relied on privateers in the past and had yet to develop its own navy, the Americans did not sign the treaty. While there was some privateering during the American Civil War, 1861-65. The need for them soon subsided as navies developed by enlistment and draft. Privateering has not been used in more than 100 years. What is privateering? Privateering is the hiring of privately owned ships and their crews to fight during battle. The practice, dating back to the 1400s, continued well into the 1800s. Eventually replaced by the development of strong navies. Privateers were, essentially, gunboats for hire. They played a crucial role in the American Revolutionary War, 1775-83, after the Second Continental. Congress authorized their use on March 18, 1776, enabling the colonists to capture about 600 British ships. 
the Americans would again employ privateers in the War of 1812, 1812 to 14. But during times of peace, some privateers turned to pirating, which at least in part prompted European nations to sign the Treaty of Paris of 1856, which ended the Crimean War, 1853-56, and outlawed privateering. Since the United States had relied on privateers in the past and had yet to develop its own navy, the Americans did not sign the treaty. While there was some privateering during the American Civil War, 1861-65. The need for them soon subsided as navies developed by enlistment and draft. Privateering has not been used in more than 100 years. What was the Crimean War? The Crimean War was fought from 1853 to 1856 between Russian forces and the Allied armies of Britain. France, the Ottoman Empire, present-day Turkey, and Sardinia, part of present-day Italy. The Crimean Peninsula, which juts out into the Black Sea and is today part of Ukraine, was the setting for many of the battles. The source of the conflict was Russia's continued expansion into the Black Sea region which, if left unchecked, would have resulted in strategic and commercial advantages for Russia. But Russia was unable to muster the strength it needed to combat the powerful alliance formed by the European countries and the Ottoman Empire. The war was ended with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, 1856, which required Russia to surrender lands it had taken from the Ottoman Empire and abolished Russian Navy and military presence in the Black Sea region. It was the first conflict that was covered by newspaper reporters at the front. What was the Crimean War? The Crimean War was fought from 1853 to 1856 between Russian forces and the Allied armies of Britain, France, the Ottoman Empire, present-day Turkey, and Sardinia, part of present-day Italy. The Crimean Peninsula, which juts out into the Black Sea and is today part of Ukraine, was the setting for many of the battles. The source of the conflict was Russia's continued expansion into the Black Sea region which, if left unchecked, would have resulted in strategic and commercial advantages for Russia. But Russia was unable to muster the strength it needed to combat the powerful alliance formed by the European countries and the Ottoman Empire. The war was ended with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, 1856, which required Russia to surrender lands it had taken from the Ottoman Empire, and abolished Russian navy and military presence in the Black Sea region. It was the first conflict that was covered by newspaper reporters at the front. What was the War of Reform?
it was the period in Mexican history from 1858 to 1861 when the Federalist government collapsed and civil war ensued. In 1858 President Ignacio Comonfort, 1812-1863, who had become Mexico's leader when he helped overthrow President Antonio López de Santa Anna, 1794-1876, in 1855, felt political pressure and fled the country. Benito Juárez, 1806-1872, who had served as Minister of Justice and Minister of the Interior, assumed the presidency. His position was immediately opposed by centralists who rallied around rebellious army forces. Under this pressure, the Federalists, led by Juárez, withdrew from Mexico City and set up the capital at Veracruz, on the Gulf Coast. There they had control over customs receipts, which allowed them to purchase arms and finance their government. Eventually they defeated the Centralists and re-entered Mexico City in January 1861. Juárez was elected president later that year, but his authority was challenged again with the arrival of the French, who quickly put Maximilian, 1832-1867, in power as Emperor of Mexico. Juárez led the country in a successful campaign against the French, who were expelled in 1867 when Juárez resumed the presidency. He died in office in 1872. What was the War of Reform? It was the period in Mexican history from 1858 to 1861 when the Federalist government collapsed and civil war ensued. In 1858 President Ignacio Comonfort, 1812-1863, who had become Mexico's leader when he helped overthrow President Antonio López de Santa Anna, 1794-1876, in 1855, felt political pressure and fled the country. Benito Juárez, 1806-1872, who had served as Minister of Justice and Minister of the Interior, assumed the presidency. His position was immediately opposed by centralists who rallied around rebellious army forces. Under this pressure, the Federalists, led by Juárez, withdrew from Mexico City and set up the capital at Veracruz, on the Gulf Coast. There they had control over customs receipts, which allowed them to purchase arms and finance their government. Eventually they defeated the Centralists and re-entered Mexico City in January 1861. Juárez was elected president later that year, but his authority was challenged again with the arrival of the French, who quickly put Maximilian, 1832-1867, in power as Emperor of Mexico. Juárez led the country in a successful campaign against the French who were expelled in 1867 when Juárez resumed the presidency. He died in office in 1872. What does 5440 or fight mean?
The slogan refers to a dispute between the United States and Great Britain over Oregon country. Which in 1818 treaty allowed both nations to occupy. This was the territory that began at 42 degrees north latitude, the southern boundary of present-day Oregon. And extended north to 54 degrees 40 minutes north latitude, in present-day British Columbia. During the 1830s and early 1840s American expansionists insisted that U.S. rights to the Oregon country extended north to latitude 54 degrees 40 minutes, which was then the recognized southern boundary of Russian America, roughly present-day Alaska. The 11th President of the United States, James K. Polk, 1795-1849, used the slogan in his political campaign of 1844, after he was elected. Polk settled the dispute with Great Britain, in 1846, and the boundary was set at 49 degrees north. The northern boundary of what is today Washington state and the border between the United States and Canada. This agreement reached without the fight threatened in the slogan gave the United States. The territory lying between 42 and 49 degrees north latitude and Great Britain the territory. Between 49 degrees and 54 degrees 40 minutes north latitude as well as Vancouver Island. The United States portion is present-day Washington. Oregon, and Idaho as well as parts of Montana and Wyoming. What does 5440 or fight mean? The slogan refers to a dispute between the United States and Great Britain over Oregon country. Which in 1818 treaty allowed both nations to occupy. This was the territory that began at 42 degrees north latitude, the southern boundary of present-day Oregon. And extended north to 54 degrees 40 minutes north latitude, in present-day British Columbia. During the 1830s and early 1840s American expansionists insisted that U.S. rights to the Oregon country extended north to latitude 54 degrees 40 minutes, which was then the recognized southern boundary of Russian America, roughly present-day Alaska. The 11th President of the United States, James K. Polk, 1795-1849, used the slogan in his political campaign of 1844, after he was elected. Polk settled the dispute with Great Britain, in 1846, and the boundary was set at 49 degrees north. The northern boundary of what is today Washington state and the border between the United States and Canada. This agreement reached without the fight threatened in the slogan gave the United States. The territory lying between 42 and 49 degrees north latitude and Great Britain the territory. Between 49 degrees and 54 degrees 40 minutes north latitude as well as Vancouver Island. The United States portion is present-day Washington. Oregon, and Idaho as well as parts of Montana and Wyoming. Was the Civil War fought because of slavery?
For years, American school children learned that the question of slavery was the only cause of the Civil War. 1861 to 65 with 19 free states and 15 slave states making up the Union, Abraham Lincoln. 1809 to 1865 had called the country a house divided even before he became president. While slavery was central to the conflict, many believe the bloody four-year war had other causes as well. By the mid-1800s important differences had developed between the South and the North and many maintain these differences. Or vestiges of them, are still with the country today. The economy in the South was based on agriculture while the North was industrialized. The ideals and lifestyles of each region reflected these economic realities. Southerners believed their agrarian lifestyle was dependent on the labor of slaves. For a long time, slavery was viewed by some as a necessary evil. But by the early 1800s the view that slavery is morally wrong was beginning to take hold. Northern abolitionists had begun a movement to end slavery in the states. But, except for a small anti-slavery faction, these views were not shared in the South. There were other factors that contributed to the Declaration of Secession and the formation of the Confederacy. Although some still argue these factors were merely smoke screens for the defense of slavery. Disputes between the federal government and the states had limited the power of the states. And this policy was called into question by Southerners. Further, the political party system was in disarray in mid-1850s America. The disorder prompted feelings of distrust for the elected politicians who set national policy. Before the 1860 presidential election, Southern leaders urged that the South secede from the Union if Lincoln, who had publicly taken a stand against slavery, won. Was the Civil War fought because of slavery? For years, American school children learned that the question of slavery was the only cause of the Civil War. 1861 to 65 with 19 free states and 15 slave states making up the Union, Abraham Lincoln. 1809 to 1865, had called the country a house divided even before he became president. While slavery was central to the conflict, many believe the bloody four-year war had other causes as well. By the mid-1800s important differences had developed between the South and the North and many maintain these differences. Or vestiges of them are still with the country today. The economy in the South was based on agriculture while the North was industrialized. The ideals and lifestyles of each region reflected these economic realities. Southerners believed their agrarian lifestyle was dependent on the labor of slaves. For a long time, Slavery was viewed by some as a necessary evil. But by the early 1800s the view that slavery is morally wrong was beginning to take hold. Northern abolitionists had begun a movement to end slavery in the states. But, except for a small anti-slavery faction, these views were not shared in the South. There were other factors that contributed to the Declaration of Secession and the formation of the Confederacy. 
although some still argue these factors were merely smoke screens for the defense of slavery. Disputes between the federal government and the states had limited the power of the states. And this policy was called into question by Southerners. Further, the political party system was in disarray in mid-1850s America. The disorder prompted feelings of distrust for the elected politicians who set national policy. Before the 1860 presidential election, Southern leaders urged that the South secede from the Union if Lincoln, who had publicly taken a stand against slavery, won. How did the Civil War begin and end? Unhappy with the outcome of the 1860 presidential election, in which Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, was elected, and fearing a loss of their agrarian way of life, the southern states began to make good on their promise to secede if Lincoln won the presidency, South Carolina was the first, in December of that year. In January 1861 five more states followed, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana. When representatives from the six states met the next month in Montgomery, Alabama, they established the Confederate States of America and elected Jefferson Davis, 1808-1889, President. Two days before Lincoln's inauguration, Texas joined the Confederacy. Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee joined in April. Shortly after the Civil War had already begun. The Civil War, also called the War of Secession and the War Between the States, began on April 12, 1861, when Southern troops fired on Fort Sumter, a U.S. military post in Charleston, South Carolina. Brutal fighting continued for four years. On April 9, 1865, General Robert E. Lee, 1807-1870, surrendered his ragged Confederate troops to General Ulysses S. Grant, 1822-1885, of the Union at Old Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. The war had not only been between the states. It had also been between brothers, the conflict divided the nation. The Civil War took more American lives than any other war in history. How did the Civil War begin and end? Unhappy with the outcome of the 1860 presidential election, in which Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, was elected, and fearing a loss of their agrarian way of life, the southern states began to make good on their promise to secede if Lincoln won the presidency, South Carolina was the first, in December of that year. In January 1861 five more states followed, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana. When representatives from the six states met the next month in Montgomery, Alabama, they established the Confederate States of America and elected Jefferson Davis, 1808-1889, President. Two days before Lincoln's inauguration, 
Texas joined the Confederacy. Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee joined in April. Shortly after the Civil War had already begun. The Civil War, also called the War of Secession and the War Between the States, began on April 12, 1861, when Southern troops fired on Fort Sumter, a U.S. military post in Charleston, South Carolina. Brutal fighting continued for four years. On April 9, 1865, General Robert E. Lee, 1807-1870, surrendered his ragged Confederate troops to General Ulysses S. Grant, 1822-1885, of the Union at Old Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. The war had not only been between the states. It had also been between brothers, the conflict divided the nation. The Civil War took more American lives than any other war in history. Why did Andrew Johnson vow he would burn Nashville before surrendering it? It seems a strange thing for a politician to say about his home state's capital city. Andrew Johnson had served Tennessee in both the U.S. House of Representatives. 1,843 to 53, and the U.S. Senate, 1,857 to 62, he had also been governor, 1,853 to 57. But after the Civil War broke out, the Southern Democrat made a surprising move, he sided with the Union. This show of allegiance was largely owing to Johnson's strongly held belief that the South secession was unconstitutional. Having thus made his stand, President Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, saw fit to appoint Johnson as the Union's military governor in Tennessee. When rebel forces surrounded Nashville and seemed poised to take it, Johnson proclaimed he would sooner burn the city before surrendering it. But he was forced to do neither, in mid-December 1864 Union forces used the hand-cranked Gatling gun. Invented in 1861, to help defeat the Confederate forces. Why did Andrew Johnson vow he would burn Nashville before surrendering it? It seems a strange thing for a politician to say about his home state's capital city. Andrew Johnson had served Tennessee in both the U.S. House of Representatives. 1,843 to 53, and the U.S. Senate, 1,857 to 62, he had also been governor, 1,853 to 57. But after the Civil War broke out, the Southern Democrat made a surprising move, he sided with the Union. This show of allegiance was largely owing to Johnson's strongly held belief that the South secession was unconstitutional. Having thus made his stand, President Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, saw fit to appoint Johnson as the Union's military governor in Tennessee. When rebel forces surrounded Nashville and seemed poised to take it, 
Johnson proclaimed he would sooner burn the city before surrendering it. But he was forced to do neither, in mid-December 1864 Union forces used the hand-cranked Gatling gun. Invented in 1861, to help defeat the Confederate forces. Why was the battle at Gettysburg important? The 1863 battle, fought when the two sides met accidentally in the southern Pennsylvania town, was a turning point in the Civil War. From July 1st to 3 General George Meade, 1815 to 1872, led his troops, about 90,000 strong, to defeat the advancing Confederate troops, numbering some 75,000, under General Robert E. Lee. 1807 to 1870, the Union win effectively stopped Lee's invasion of the North. The following November 19, President Abraham Lincoln, 1809 to 1865, made the historical address at Gettysburg. As he dedicated part of the battlefield as a national cemetery. Beginning with the now famous words four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation. Conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. The short speech, which Lincoln rewrote many times, closed by issuing a rallying cry for the nation as a whole, saying, We here highly resolve that the dead shall not have died in vain, that the nation shall, under God, have a new birth of freedom, and that governments of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Why was the battle at Gettysburg important? The 1863 battle, fought when the two sides met accidentally in the southern Pennsylvania town, was a turning point in the Civil War. From July 1st to 3 General George Meade, 1815 to 1872, led his troops, about 90,000 strong, to defeat the advancing Confederate troops, numbering some 75,000, under General Robert E. Lee. 1807 to 1870, the Union win effectively stopped Lee's invasion of the North. The following November 19, President Abraham Lincoln, 1809 to 1865, made the historical address at Gettysburg. As he dedicated part of the battlefield as a national cemetery. Beginning with the now famous words four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation. Conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. The short speech, which Lincoln rewrote many times, closed by issuing a rallying cry for the nation as a whole, saying, We here highly resolve that the dead shall not have died in vain, that the nation shall, under God, have a new birth of freedom, and that governments of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Why was the battle at Gettysburg important? The 
The 1863 battle, fought when the two sides met accidentally in the southern Pennsylvania town, was a turning point in the Civil War. From July 1 to 3 General George Meade, 1815 to 1872, led his troops, about 90,000 strong, to defeat the advancing Confederate troops, numbering some 75,000, under General Robert E. Lee. 1807 to 1870, the Union win effectively stopped Lee's invasion of the North. The following November 19, President Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, made the historical address at Gettysburg. As he dedicated part of the battlefield as a national cemetery. Beginning with the now famous words four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation. Conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. The short speech, which Lincoln rewrote many times, closed by issuing a rallying cry for the nation as a whole, saying, We here highly resolve that the dead shall not have died in vain, that the nation shall, under God, have a new birth of freedom, and that governments of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. What did the United States gain from the Mexican War? The Mexican War, 1846-48, was officially ended when the U.S. Senate ratified the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on March 10, 1848. By the treaty, Mexico relinquished roughly half its territory New Mexico and California to the United States. Mexico also recognized the Rio Grande as its border with Texas. Mexico received payments in the millions from the United States, which also assumed the payment of claims of its citizens. Five years later under the terms of the Gadsden Purchase, the United States purchased a small portion of land from Mexico for another $10 million, which was widely regarded as further compensation for the land lost in the war. The territory the United States gained was in present-day Arizona and New Mexico, south of the Gila River. Why is Paul Revere's ride so well known? The April 18, 1775, event was famous in its own right but was memorialized by American writer Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. 1807-1882, in his poem, Paul Revere's Ride. The verse contains an error, or perhaps Longfellow simply took literary license. About the night that the American Revolution, 1775-83, began, the light signal that was to be flashed from Boston's Old North Church. One light if the British were approaching the Patriots by land and two if the approach was by sea was sent not to Revere, it was received by Revere's compatriots in Charlestown, now part of Boston proper. However, Revere did ride that night on a borrowed horse. He left Boston at about 10 p.m. and arrived in Lexington at midnight to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock. 
who were wanted for treason, that the British were coming. The next day, April 19, the battles of Lexington and Concord were fought. Starting the Revolutionary War in America As an American patriot, Revere, 1735-1818, was known for his service as a special messenger. So much so that by 1773 he had already been mentioned in London newspapers. Revere also participated in the Boston Tea Party in 1773. What were the Swedish colonial holdings? The Swedish possessions consisted of a small colony called New Sweden. Established in 1638 at Fort Christina, present-day Wilmington, Delaware. The Swedes gradually extended the settlement from the mouth of the Delaware Bay. South of Wilmington, northward along the Delaware River as far as present-day Trenton, New Jersey. The settlers were mostly fur traders, though there was farming in the colony as well. In 1655 the territory was taken by the Dutch in a military expedition led by Director General of New Netherlands Peter Stuyvesant, c. 1610-1672. For nine years the territory was part of the Dutch colonial claims called New Netherlands. In 1664 the English claimed it and the rest of New Netherlands. Delaware was set up as a British proprietary colony which it remained until the outbreak of the American Revolution, 1775-83. New Sweden was the only Swedish colony in the Americas. What is privateering? Privateering is the hiring of privately owned ships and their crews to fight during battle. The practice, dating back to the 1400s, continued well into the 1800s. Eventually replaced by the development of strong navies. Privateers were, essentially, gunboats for hire. They played a crucial role in the American Revolutionary War, 1775-83, after the Second Continental. Congress authorized their use on March 18, 1776, enabling the colonists to capture about 600 British ships. The Americans would again employ privateers in the War of 1812, 1812 to 14. But during times of peace, some privateers turned to pirating, which at least in part prompted European nations to sign the Treaty of Paris of 1856, which ended the Crimean War, 1853 to 56, and outlawed privateering. Since the United States had relied on privateers in the past and had yet to develop its own navy. The Americans did not sign the treaty. While there was some privateering during the American Civil War, 1861-65. The need for them soon subsided as navies developed by enlistment and draft. Privateering has not been used in more than 100 years. <laughs>